So benefits of sex. There must be something useful about sexual reproduction compared to asexual reproduction because we see these sorts of adaptations in the wild. So this is one species of plant, the harebell. And what this female, well, hermaphrodite flower, right? it's got a stigma, it's got anthers. This is a flower that will self eventually, but it wants to, it delays selfing. So what it's stigma eventually does is it curls and curls and curls and curls and curls down here and then it selfs by touching the anthers. It's got this sort of built-in fuse where if anybody comes along and pollinates, cross-pollinates, then it seems like this flower prefers that. But if all else fails, then it's got this mechanism where its style rolls and rolls and rolls and then eventually it touches its own anthers and self-fertilizes. So there's a benefit to sex, and a lot of organisms try to have outcrossing or sexual reproduction as opposed to hermaphroditic self-reproduction. So you all know that one of the main benefits to sex is variation, genetic variation, helps improve your ability to have fitness if you find yourself in an environment that is hostile or demands some sort of change. Where have we seen this sort of figure in this class before? So you have the idea here is that you've got a population of individuals. You've got a fixed population size. Let's say you've got 500 individuals. For example, and this is in your textbook, absolutely. So at some point in time right here, Mutation A arises in a single individual. So the new mutation at that point in time in the population. And the same happens for a different individual who gets mutation C and a third individual who gets mutation B. So what does it mean that there's a little ellipse here for mutation B? What's happening over time in the population? So it increases in frequency. So this one mutation eventually gets into like an eighth of the population size or so. And then what happens? It goes extinct. We saw this when we played with red links a little bit, that every mutation has a specific, its frequency dictates how likely it is to go to fixation. So when you have a new mutation in any size population, it can increase in frequency for a time, and then it decreases and goes extinct in that population. And the same happened here with mutation C, just a diagram. But what happened to mutation A? Instead of going extinct, what happened to mutation A? It went to fixation. So over time, everybody in the population has mutation A, and that occurs at this time point, right, where mutation A has fixed. It's gone to 100% of the individuals in the population. The goal, presumably, in this story, the goal of this population is to reach the trio of mutations A, B, and C. So presumably, that combination is the fittest set of mutations you could have in that population. It's a population that's faced with some sort of a challenge. The goal, although of course evolution never knows that there's a goal, it's just random mutation, the goal would be to get to mutation A, B, and C all together. So in this asexual population, what's happening here? We've got an individual that, that is in the population that has mutation A. What happens? So there's something, what's changed here? We had an individual that had A and now addition, mutation, additional mutation has happened. So this, this individual happened to have gotten that second mutation, mutation C, at that point in time. So it was an individual that already had mutation A now by chance happens to get the second of the three mutations that would be the goal if there was one. But unfortunately for this individual, what didn't happen? So C didn't go into fixation, C got lost. So now you're back to an individual that just has mutation A by itself. What would have had to have happened in this individual to reach the fitness peak, optimal fitness? 
If you've got mutations A and C, what else has to happen? In that tiny little fraction of the population. Yeah, you have to also have mutation B. Well, here's an individual that, had, that was starting off in a population that had mutation A. This individual here got mutation B. So that individual is only one step away now from having the trio, A, B, and C. And that happened right here. So an individual that had mutations A and B now gets the third mutation, and now there's at least one individual in the population that has that trio of mutations that make them really ideally suited for their environment. This takes, the point of this is it takes a really long time because you have to wait for mutation A to occur. Then you have to wait for one of the individuals that has that mutation. While that mutation is still in existence before it gets lost, somebody has to get B and C too. So those mutations, random mutations, have to occur in fairly quick succession for a single individual to get all of the mutations that creates a phenotype that's useful. Or, as drawn here, you have to wait for one mutation to go to fixation and then have the second mutation occur and go to fixation and then have the third mutation occur and go to fixation before everybody gets this benefit. That's asexual reproduction. Where have we seen this concept before? That there's a series of mutations that occurs before you reach higher fitness. Yeah, right, exactly. So E. coli, we talked about Rich Lenski's long-term evolution experiments, where he showed that there were a number of mutations over thousands of generations that had to occur for an E. coli population to actually evolve. For example, in that case, to metabolize a new carbon source. So let's contrast this with what happens in sexual reproduction. How does sexual reproduction solve this problem? So this is bacteria, for example. Single individuals just dividing and selfing. How does sex solve this problem? Right. So at this point in time here, I'll circle in red, all three of the mutations existed in this population at this point in time. A was present, and B was present, and C was present in three different individuals. So with recombination, with sexual reproduction, if these bacteria, for example, were able to mate with each other, they could, by the fusion of cells from those three different individuals, fertilization, they could immediately combine those three mutations together in a much faster period of time. So you don't wait nearly as long in a sexually reproducing population to be able to combine useful alleles. So one of the benefits of sex. Get new combinations of phenotypes faster. Bless you. There are a couple of other benefits related to the fact that sexual reproduction involves recombination. One of them is called Muller's ratchet, and that's one of the most important concepts for you to understand for this chapter. Is everybody okay with the concept of the ratchet? Like a wrench, you turn only one direction, you spin it the other direction, and it doesn't turn. So you can only turn a screw or a bolt one direction using a ratchet. In this case, that's the analogy that's being used is Muller's ratchet in evolution is a concept. It's not an actual tool. It doesn't have anything to do with screwing. Although this is sexual <laughs> reproduction, but sorry. That was bad, sorry. Maybe I should bolt. What time is it? The concept here is that when deleterious mutations occur, that is bad mutations, occur at random on chromosomes, if you're in an asexual population, you can never get rid of bad combinations of mutations. So in this example, every one of these chromosomes has two mutations in figure A here. So each of these little circles represents a bad mutation on a chromosome. Right. Which is the best chromosome up here? 
There is one that's actually better than the rest up here in panel A. Right? There's one chromosome that has one mutation. So that's sort of like the optimal chromosome. That's the best chromosome in the population. If you were going to be an offspring of any of these individuals, you'd want to be that, you'd want that bacterium to be your parent, I guess. But then over here, a new mutation arises. And that's what happens during life. Mutations arise spontaneously. Now we have a situation where we have a population that has all of the different versions of this chromosome in the population have two mutations. So there was a point in time back there when there was a chromosome that had one mutation where you could actually be more fit if you got that chromosome with one mutation. Now we've got a worse situation in the entire population because nobody has that useful chromosome that just at least only has one bad mutation. So that's one thing that can happen is new mutations can occur to cause loss of chromosomes that have few mutations on them. This bottom section, panel B, represents something else. <coughs> What happened to that one chromosome that was the useful chromosome to have, the better chromosome? That individual happened not to reproduce. So chance events, genetic drift, we call it, right? So by chance, that individual that had the best chromosome didn't happen to produce any offspring. And so again, that most useful, best version of the chromosome in the population has been lost forever. didn't reproduce, had zero fitness, despite the fact that this was a better version of this one chromosome. <laughs> so, what, so this is the ratchet. In both of these scenarios, the ratchet has turned once. We've gone from a situation where there was a chromosome with one mutation. So the best version of the chromosome there had one mutation. And then after a period of time, now what's the best scenario? The best you can hope for if you're in a population on the right is that you inherit a, a chromosome that has two bad mutations. That's the best you can do. And then, of course, as time goes on, these chromosomes pick up yet more mutations and more mutations, and the ratchet keeps turning. In an asexually reproducing population, if you're clonally reproducing, all your chromosomes do is pick up extra mutations, more mutations, more mutations, more mutations. <coughs> How does sex fix this problem? The ones with the bad mutations are much less likely to reproduce. So selection like, less likely to reproduce. Well, the same is true in asexual populations, though. So there's still selection against asexual populations. So Even someone with a bad mutation <coughs> Okay, so if you have recombination in sex, right, meiosis, how does that help this situation? So if we start in the situation where we've got on the left now the same population we had on the right in the previous slide, the best chromosome has two mutations. All of them have two mutations. If you're making gametes, if you're a sexually reproducing organism, what happens? So you get this crossover event, for example, random crossover events. They happen anywhere along the chromosome. You never know what gamete you're going to produce. But in this case, you can actually produce, through this recombination event, you use that portion of that chromosome, recombination, and then you get that portion of the second chromosome. You reproduce, you reproduce a chromosome that only has one mutation. So random my, meiosis, recombination, shuffles up the mutations that exist on chromosomes, something that asexual reproducing organisms can't do. They just pass their whole chromosomes on from mother to daughter cell. But with recombination, you can actually reverse Muller's ratchet. It's no longer a unidirectional process where it's mutation, 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 mutation. With recombination, you can actually recover, remake, some chromosomes that have fewer mutations. So.
sex helps. It's really meiosis. But that's the essence of sexual reproduction. Any questions or concerns, comments? And the important thing here is to take the concept of what Muller's ratchet means. Multiple mutations will continue to occur over time in an asexually reproducing population, and meiosis recombination can actually undo the accumulation of mutations. Yeah? So is this high complex organisms take longer to evolve? Do, do complex organisms take longer to evolve? So the question is, is this why? But my question is, do what multicellular organisms, complex, multicellular, do multicellular organisms take longer to evolve? I would argue this might actually make them evolve faster because you make new combinations of mutations faster. So what's the other difference between most asexually reproducing taxa and most sexually reproducing taxa that affects evolution? Yeah, generation time is one response that I would make, that multicellular organisms tend to live longer and take longer to start reproducing. So that's one of the key features in what makes some of us, some of us species, evolve more slowly. It takes longer to actually produce the next generation and to get, see whether or not there's a benefit or a detriment to the new combination of genotypes that have been put into their offspring. Okay. So I want to go with that sort of backdrop in mind through two quick examples of literature that shows, some data from literature that shows the benefit of sex. And one of these is quite more bizarre than another. The one on the bottom we'll end with. It's really cool. The story I'm going to tell you, though, the second story about sex affecting your lifespan, the mechanism isn't known. So I'm, spoiler alert. It's just empirical evidence that shows that in one species, having sex makes you live longer. Nobody knows why or how, the mechanism. It's just an observation. But, and not in humans either, I apologize. <laughs> it would be nice if it was in humans, but it's not. But the first one we talk about is going to be in yeast, as it says. So I've already mentioned to you before that yeast can reproduce either sexually or asexually. And that made yeast a perfect system to study this question of does sex affect your ability to evolve. Because you can compare the same organism, just how, is it, how fit is it when it's asexually, asexually reproducing compared to the same lineage, the same organism, the same species, when it's in a sexually reproducing phase. So you can measure the fitness of both of these together and compare them. So you just get a baseline reading. Does sex, does meiosis actually improve fitness? The key point from this slide is that they made an engineered asexual strain. So they compare a strain that's reproducing sexually, like we discussed a couple of classes ago, where you have diploid cells that produce haploid gametes, and those haploid gametes come back together in different combinations to produce new diploid organisms, like we do. So you consider these spores kind of like their gametes. The gametes fuse together to produce new diploid organisms. So that's their sexually reproducing pathway. And these geneticists forced by mutation the same strain of yeast to not produce haploid gametes when they sporulate, but instead to produce diploid gametes. Right. So this was clonal reproduction. A mom could produce a mother cell, a single diploid cell, could produce four gametes, but there was no outcrossing. Right. This is all selfing. So you notice over here in the panel on the left, these spores, for example, an alpha from that mom could combine with an A from that mom to produce a new diploid organism. That's outcrossing. Different mothers producing, and different parents, producing gametes that fuse together. Sexual reproduction. Two different parents involved in the process. On the right is just a single parent producing, again, diploid offspring. So in both cases, diploid parents make diploid offspring. So they're comparing apples and apples in this experiment. 
The only difference is there's outcrossing on the left and selfing on the right. It's, per, it's basically parthenogenesis on the right. One individual makes two gametes. Those two gametes are forced to fertilize each other, essentially. I'll put a question mark after it. Parthenogenesis. So this is, sorry, I should go back for it. So they grow these yeast, asexually reproducing and sexually reproducing up here. So you've got sexual versus asexual, four different conditions. So they've grown two of these, a pair of sexual and asexual in harsh conditions. Osmotic stress, so they grow them in high salt. So they grow these strains in some sort of condition that they would predict would invoke or require some adaptation, some evolution. The yeast don't like these harsh conditions. They expect, they want to test how does fitness increase in the asexually reproducing versus the sexually reproducing strains. What happens? If they put the yeast in benign conditions, that is favorable, normal conditions for growing for yeast. You give them sugar, give them a nice petri dish to grow on, some agar media. Do they get fitter over time? So the, what is that, green and yellow? Right. So those data points basically fall along zero relative fitness. That is, they don't increase their fitness over time, they just cruise right along. They don't change. You haven't challenged them, you haven't changed their environment. So they don't get any more fit, they don't get less fit. But when you compare the sexual versus the asexual strains, when you challenge them by putting them in a new environment that, they ha that has an obstacle they need to overcome, what happens? So the blue data points are the asexual data points. The average, which is this line, the average of all the data points, fitnesses across multiple generations, is lower than the average fitness of the sexually reproducing strain. So it suggests that the ability for yeast to be able to get gametes from two different parents and put them together, that was the only difference in that experimental setup. Were you self-fertilizing or were you outcrossing? Were you inbreeding or outcrossing? The top line is outcrossing. So the ability to combine gametes from different parents is beneficial to yeast in this case, compared to having to be selfing. Right. Experimental evidence that sex is good, in case you want to, you know, next time you're at the bar, cocktail party, <laughs> whip this out. Check it out. No, actually, save it for the next story. The next story is way better to tell at a cocktail party. So benefits of sex, lifespan. Could having sex make you live longer? So this has entirely to do with a certain type of organism that we are not. So this is eusocial insects. Ones where one specific individual is the breeding individual. So this is often like ants and bees, right? There's a queen bee, there's a queen ant that has all of the offspring. And then there's a worker <laughs> caste that's a different sex usually that their job is entirely to take care of the offspring. So that, those are definitions or defining features of eusocial insects or organisms, not just insects. And it's true in most of these species that if you happen to be the one that's reproducing, you live longer. Why might that be? Again, we don't know what the mechanism is, but just imagine you're the queen bee, right? That's a phrase. You're the queen bee. What does that mean? Doesn't all, all the other ants do everything else for her, so there's no risk to her life? So that might be part of it. She, she's pampered. She's the queen bee. Everyone's taking care of her. She, all she has to do is produce offspring, and then the workers carry the offspring away and take care of them. And People bring people. <laughs> workers bring her food. Right? Yeah, and indeed, maybe there's no risk. Maybe she never has to go out and forage. She just stays in the hive or in the nest. Other thoughts about why being the queen might make you live longer?
That's always the first thing I think of is, yeah, it's, it's a cushy lifestyle. So the workers are haploid. The queen is not. Wait, Does that? The drones are haploid, though. The workers are diploid. Or the workers are diploid. The drones are haploid. Yeah. Do, but does ploidy affect lifespan, I guess, is the question. Does it matter how many copies of the genome you have? Does that affect your lifespan? I don't know. Something I'll have to look into. So it turns out, yeah, seeing a lot of good faces out there in the audience right now. <laughs> turns out that there are some mammals that do use sociality as well. Naked mole rats being, and this was mentioned in the lyrics to our video, right? Naked mole rats, right? That's why. So they're studied by evolutionary biologists because these are like the mammals that prove they're the exception to the rule. <laughs> that mammals tend not to be used social, but there are species where there is one female who's the reproducing female. And Damon and Berta, a while ago, about a decade ago, right, this is just observation. It's just empirical data. They wanted to know how long individuals live, if they're mating or non-mating, and if they're male or they're female. So the breeders are the symbols that are shown in black, and the females are squares. <coughs> so look how long you live if you happen to, it doesn't matter if you're the queen or one of the reproductive males, your lifespan something like doubles. What organisms were these? This is, these are the naked mole rats. Yeah. So they were just interested in this idea that maybe there's something about eusociality because it was known that in bees and ants, the queens lived longer than everybody else. And there was this correlation that people <coughs> at that point had thought, well, there's something about being you social that if you're the sexually reproduce reproducing version of the organism, you live longer. And here was an opportunity to test if that was also true in mammals when there's you sociality. So it was looking for correlation between lifestyle, essentially, and aging. And so when you compare, for example, the triangles, male non-breeders versus male breeders, something like more than double your lifespan if you happen to be one of the males that's reproducing. So it doesn't even matter if you're the queen, if you're the female that's reproducing. Even the males that are reproducing live longer than the ones that aren't. And the effect also exists for reproducing females. So I leave a question mark there after the question, is this a benefit of sex? Because this is just correlation. It doesn't really prove, and most humans know that at least in humans, sexual reproduction does not necessarily make you live longer. Well, this isn't seen in all sexually reproducing animals, like you just said. So I don't know that this would really count. Right. So you sociality. Is there something about having a small number of individuals be the reproducing ones that gives them a fitness edge. Then it might all come back to being pampered. I don't know. Yeah. How, how are breeders and non-breeders decided in genetics? In mole rats? I don't recall, but that's an excellent point, because if we're in an evolution class, you'd want to know, is there something genetically different about who gets to breed and who doesn't? Because, because I'm guessing they get to breed maybe the earlier on the end of their uh, chromosome. Oh, interesting question. So is there a correlation between telomere length and lifespan? Great question. Mind if I do some research on that? I'll give you credit in the acknowledgments in the manuscript I wrote. Unless you want to come do research with me, in which case you could be one of the authors. Other questions? Comments? Yeah. Mm. But when you go into the breeding males and females, why is it that the females live longer than the males when they're also breeding? Okay, so the, the point is that, yeah, if you look at the non-breeders, they seem to follow the same lifespan trajectory, male versus female. 
but there seems to be a difference in trajectory, male versus female, when you are also a breeder. So is this two different effects that are being combined? One, that you get longer lifespan if you're a breeder, and then you get an even longer lifespan if you happen to be the female breeder. Are there two additive effects here? Or sorry, is the males that live, males that live longer? Okay, so yeah, there might be a risk to bearing children. It makes you age. <laughs> Although I'm not a female, I can testify. Don't tell your wife that. Yeah. No, definitely not. And Mother's Day is coming up, right? <laughs> don't worry, I ordered her some chocolates. Shh, don't you know, turn off the recording. She doesn't watch these movies anyway. Okay. So that's an excellent point. Another question, you'd, what else would you want to know about this experiment? How, like, what kind of conditions the non-breeders were under? Like, so, what kind of predatorial situations were they encountering or risks they were encountering? Okay. So they were limited when they were closer. Perfect. So, yeah, do the breeders and the non-breeders have different environments? So you'd want to know something about how this study was designed. Was it controlled? Were they living in terrariums? Or were these wild naked mole rats where the non-breeders are out foraging and maybe... So another related question would be, how did they die? Mm. Did they all die of old age or were some of them killed? I was also thinking in the case of bees, like what if maybe a longer lifespan could be like potential for all of them, but it is, like again, related to their environment. I know as far as uh, worker bees, their lifespan can be anywhere from a few weeks to like a few months, depending on the season that they're born mm -hmm. in. Like if they're, because yeah. like say if they're born during, uh, during the summer, then like there's the whole thing that they're, they spend all of their life uh, foraging, foraging. Yeah. and pretty much work themselves to death. Great life. <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely true. So yeah, when were they born? What were they doing before they died? What was their life like? Another question, anybody else? I thought of one other thing, in case there's no other comments. You might want to know how many individuals each of these data points represents. That is, is a statistically significant difference when you see this trend of males versus females. If this is only one or two females and one or two males, it might be that those lines are essentially the same. I mean, they told you up here the N, number of starting individuals, 24, 21, 22, and 28. So they have basically the same number of individuals they're comparing, but that might not be enough individuals in each of these four categories to make a really conclusive case. Okay. So naked mole rats are weird in other ways, too. They break, very, they break a lot of sort of mammalian rules about childbirth and child rearing. The number of offspring they have, the, the ratio of the number of nipples to offspring. Usually in mammals, there's that two to one rule where there are twice as many mammary glands as there are kids that you produce. But that's not true in naked mole rats. Sometimes there are excess kids relative to the number of nipples. So there's some, there's some other weird things too that maybe have to be controlled for in the naked mole rat scenario. So before we get to Socrative, 